Hello, my name is Deborah Henderson. I am a principal user researcher with Xbox, and I am here to talk about developing the skills of your UR team, or at least how I tend to think about it. Now, when thinking about development, I think the first and most basic question you have to ask is, what do you want to train, right? What are the skills you are trying to develop? And for me, they come in sort of four flavors. However, each of these flavors has something in common. They are not necessarily knowledge bases or tactical things or anything like that. Rather, what they are is lenses with which a UR can view a problem, right? So I think about research as a lens. When I see a problem, I look at it through a research lens and I think, what is the right method to get the answer to this question? Similarly, I think URs need to know about games, not just how to play them or experience them, but also to develop into understanding how you design them and think about them from a development perspective. That is another lens to apply towards any problem that comes to a UR. A third lens for looking at a problem is production. I have a problem, I know it's there, I know it would be good for gamers, I know how a designer would solve it, but when do I ask to get the this sort of solution implemented? That's a separate problem, that's a production problem, right? Understanding when people can do what, that's its own ball of wax. It's its own way to look at a problem and its own, its own way to look at a solution. And finally, the fourth lens that I think that it's important to develop in URs is a systemic lens. And here I mean to just recognize that you are a part of a system. So I belong to Xbox Research, our group belongs to Xbox, Xbox belongs to Microsoft, Microsoft lives in the United States, the United States lives in the world. These are systems within systems within systems. And What's interesting about systems is that as there can be sort of forces and pressures from outside systems that come along and sweep you up. We are all sort of flots of jetsam at some point in these great big systems. As an example, GDPR is a system that I suspect uh, has swept a number of you along, right? You had to change your behavior because somewhere in England, a law was implemented and suddenly this had ripple effects. These are the four lenses that I think are really key to be developed in a UR. But at the same time, I do want to acknowledge one that is missing, right? I show this, these as like, these are the key th skills that I think you need to develop. And normally a reaction is, um, but what about soft skills? And soft skills are important. You need to be able to persuade people. But for me, I find them interrelated to these knowledge bases. So I tend to think of them more like this. When I'm good at research, I can use research to persuade people. When I understand how a designer thinks about a design problem or a game, I understand how to persuade them, similar with production and system. It's not that the skills themselves are necessarily different, right? I am always building an empathy bridge, trying to understand the needs and wants of the person I'm persuading, and then tailoring my message to them so they can better understand me. What changes is that I have a better understanding of their perspective because I have grown to have different ways to look at the same problem. So if this is what you are trying to develop, and it's certainly what I try to develop in URs that I'm mentoring, I think the next question is, who are you training? I think this is a tempting question to skip over, right? I'm, I'm training my directs. I'm training the people I mentor. I'm training the people who are somehow looking up to me in some way. And that's absolutely true. You're definitely going to be wanting to train an individual. But I think there's another entity to acknowledge. I think that you need to think about both the needs of the individual you are training, but also the needs of the organization, which to be clear, you are also training, right? The organization is going to be providing training for the individual, but I'm gonna argue that the individual can also provide training and development for the organization all up. Now, it's worth thinking about both of these perspectives because of course, their needs are very different. The individual, this is Snowflake, they are a unique individual, right? They need instruction that is tailored to their strengths and weaknesses. And yet, when I look at the organization's need, the point of developing URs is not to heighten their individuality necessarily, although that certainly comes out of it sometimes. Rather, 
the goal of an organization is really to establish a consistent quality bar and a set of replicable processes independent of specific researchers. Because of course, researchers leave. And if your entire knowledge base is tied up in an individual, then that knowledge leaves with them. The organization needs to be resilient. The organization needs to see individuals not as snowflakes, but rather as just another board in Theseus' ship. So it's easy to see these two perspectives as being deeply conflicting. But what I'm going to argue, and the point of this talk really, is to say that I think you can take these two perspectives and tie them into a singular engine that benefits both the individual and the organization. Here's how. So we begin with the individual. And they know some stuff, but they do not all this, know all the stuff. Fortunately, there's an organization. And this organization can provide institutional knowledge and process. Let's take a moment and talk about how we do that. So I'll be honest and say we take, again, this kind of split perspective. It, it carries through in the way that the organization tends to train people. So first off, the organization just documents a lot of stuff. This is our 101 page. This is what we would expect when you are first hired in as a baby you are, a UR1. You come in and we say, great, here is an absolute boatload of information that we have collected over time and we have tried to make as approachable for new stakeholders as possible, right? At the same time, it is worth not acknowledging that this covers these sort of four lenses that I'm talking about. For one thing, we add Xbox Game Pass to it. In the past, we would just uh, give people access to a library of games, but we teach things that are about our own system, so how Xbox research works. We also teach them things about the Microsoft system all up. We also teach them about the methods that are specific to games user research. We teach a little bit about soft skills, though not that much, and we teach a fair bit about production, like how does production work and how does UR fit into it? At the same time, um, it is worth noting that these are things that haven't necessarily been built originally for games user researchers. So I'm going to give you a specific example. This is a lovely sort of one pager explaining the difference between playtest and usability, right? This is incredibly useful for handing to teams because you go through and you say, yes, 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 I know you're asking for a playtest. The way that we use the word playtest is very specific with an Xbox research. Here's how we use it. Um, and really what this is nice for is really training teams to understand that it's the nature of the question that matters to them. It is also, however, very useful when training individual URs, right? You can go through and say, look, this is the thing you need to start practicing explaining to your teams from a soft skills perspective, but also you need to understand the difference in this as a researcher, right? You need to understand the kinds of questions that you can answer with one method versus another. Now, we don't just throw this documentation at people. Instead, we pair it with individual trainings. So for the individual, we give them typically manager or mentor support, right? We say, go off, read this, and I want to come back and have an hour long meeting with you. And we're, we're just going to talk about the reading. What questions did you have? What made sense to you? What didn't make sense to you? That sort of thing. And that's a way to give the individual both the default baseline understanding of what we mean by methods, but also just tailor it to them so that their unique expectations and assumptions are addressed and either amplified and celebrated or maybe corrected. Right. The other thing we do is we tend to train um, very practically so that when people are doing their first usability or their first play test, we will give feedback on every single individual step of the process. It is very, very detailed. Um, generally speaking, this takes twice as long as somebody who is fully trained to go through the whole process. Um, but part of why we do this is just because observation and feedback is really important when mastering qualitative methods, right? It is hard to tell people in the abstract that you should give someone space in an interview and allow the silence to become awkward, which is true, but at the same point, it's hard to sort of catch that moment and to recognize it when it's happening. And you need somebody who's just a little bit more experienced with you to observe you and give you feedback. So we pair it with practical training and we believe in the practical training to such an extent that even the most senior among us have our reports reviewed, right? So um, my manager is Randy, he is the director of the entire organization. He nonetheless has to read through every single usability report that I do because it is important that I get his feedback and I understand um, when, and I'm just challenged, I guess is what I would say. I understand his perspective, but also that I'm challenged on my conclusions and we ensure that they're really the best quality research that I could be doing.
The other way that we acknowledge the individual, and this is a little bit of a new thing for us now, but we're starting within our documentation to actually split um, the document apart a little bit. So an example of this comes from our usability training. We have two documents. One is practical, one is more theoretical. This is because we've started to see that within our own group there are two personas that we need to foster. One is people who are focused on why. Why am I doing it this way? Another is people who are focused on how. Just tell me how I'm doing it. I'll be honest and say, I think most URs come in on the why side of things. It's particularly unnerving for people who have a quantitative background to be asked to do qualitative research without them understanding some of the theory behind it. And then as URs just get more trust in our training and get more trust in the URs around them, each them and get more sort of practical skills, they tend to focus a little bit more on just how. How am I supposed to execute this? So we try to support this both in our documentation. I will say this is the point in the conversation where I do want to acknowledge that keeping up documentation is challenging. It is definitely difficult. It is absolutely, however, a priority. And the reason I think it is a priority is because by building this documentation that initially helps individuals, in the end, what you're helping really is your organization all up. So this is a priority, not necessarily for the individual, but rather for the organization. Because of course, once the institution provides knowledge and process, the individual gets to master these techniques. And that's when they start to innovate. And this is so valuable to an organization. At the same time, I will say that our philosophy is pretty strict on this. You're not allowed to jump into innovation. You really got to kind of master the basics. And by basics, I mean the full UR tool set before you're allowed to innovate. And the reason for this is pretty simple. The basic answer is that if you are a master of a singular method, then you are a hammer and everything is a nail. That's not good. So we try to get people to master the sort of full tool suite before allowing them to innovate. The other thing that I will say that this unlocks, because we have institutional knowledge and we expect to be able to provide this sort of training for people, is it changes the way that we hire. So I've talked in the past uh, in the Discord at times, and this has sort of puzzled people when I've talked about it, about how sometimes it's better for people to know less about games user research than um, knowing more, right? If you know more, if you're just like a really great researcher, but you've never had any experience there in terms of actually doing user research, sometimes this can be an advantage when interviewing with us. And in part, that's because of some of the assumptions we make, right? Because we have the institutional knowledge and process, we can hire PhDs. And what's interesting about PhDs is for the most part, they have no idea what games user research is about. They are slightly bemused to discover this field even exists, right? They might have read some papers, but normally when they start talking about those papers, they kind of flirt with disaster because they don't really understand the implications of the papers because they just haven't done the hands-on training, right? But the reason we hire PhDs, who for the record probably know less stuff than people who have actually been trained in how to do a usability, is because we expect it to pay off later, specifically once we've trained people and they start to innovate, right? I'm an example of this. So they hired me. I had no idea what a usability was. I thought it was a relatively dubious method when I first started. It was deeply sketchy to me. And then I got experience with it and I became a convert, right? And I thought about how usability mapped onto narrative. And that's where I started to innovate. And what was important is I wasn't just innovating by myself. Instead, once innovation starts, the organization has a sort of need to institutionalize this innovation at scale because, of course, methods and process must replicate, right? A method is only a method if multiple URs can do it across multiple process, products. Otherwise, it's just sort of a kind of strange thing that an individual does. Maybe insightful, maybe nuanced for the product, but it's not actually a method or a process. And this this transition is a little frustrating for people. And the reason it's frustrating and hard for people is because you're essentially taking somebody who is at maximum snowflake, right? They have gone through the training. They've been given the opportunity to innovate. They've really brought their own special sauce to the moment. And you say, that's amazing. But for this to count, you have to make yourself irrelevant. You got to get on the boat. You got to turn yourself from a, snow a snowflake into just one of Theseus's planks. Right. And this is really sort of emotionally exhausting, I think, and it brings on sort of the system sulk. So when we look at 
the sort of first growth curve that we were looking at, sort of UR1 to UR2. This is how it normally plays out for us. It's not universal, but this is sort of typical. It tends to be sort of more like modeling RPG growth, right? Which is a lot of fun because you go out, you get a mission, do a usability, you go out, you do it, you earn some experience, you level up. It's amazing, right? You go out, you get another mission, do a play test, go out, do that, execute it beautifully, do a second one by yourself. Oh man, ding, ding, you're leveling up. It's great. By contrast, this kind of transition where you have to stop are no longer taught sort of standard things and instead are asked to innovate and then take it to scale. That's hard. It's hard both because of the skill mastery shift, right, which is challenging, but also because you have to learn to remove yourself from your innovation. It really requires a certain level of what I'm referring to as systems understanding. You have to understand how to take a method and move it outside of yourself so it works within your organization. Fortunately, there are ways to sort of baby step people through this. So of course, the first thing with any form of training is that your organization has to message to the individual that you are looking for this behavior, that you expect this behavior, that you value this behavior. And then the second and perhaps more difficult thing is that you have to convince people that you can consistently judge whether or not they're doing a good job with this sort of behavior. I will tell you, um, I think this is a challenge. I think there are different ways that this can express. But for me, this tends to be a typical progression skill, a sort of path that individuals take when they're leveling up their systems understanding. So first off, when you ask somebody, hey, like it's great that you did a method or you've thought through a problem set or you've developed a process, but do you think you could maybe sort of document this in some way so that other people could take advantage of it? Typically their first reaction is to just sort of write literally everything down and be like, good luck. I mean, here are all your choices. Good luck with that. A more sophisticated approach to that is perhaps to say, hey, here are all your options, but also here's a framework to kind of help you work your way through your options so you make good decisions. An even more sophisticated approach would be somebody who says, hey, I'm actually going to give you a default recommendation. And here's why you should just assume that you're doing this. Here are the ways in which you might need to adjust it. But like, generally speaking, this is a really good solid approach. And this is lovely because it really offloads a lot of the responsibility from the person who's learning it the next time onto the person who is nominally the expert. That being said, it is a much, much, much more difficult thing to do because of course, you can't just declare by fiat that something is the default. You need to get buy-in from everybody who might have an opinion. And that is really where the work of systems design oftentimes come in, like making sure that all of the needs are understood and the alignment is very clear so your organization as a whole can have a perspective. And then finally, I think the most sophisticated way that people do this is they don't just have a sort of systems understanding of the piece that they are adding, but they also understand how it fully integrates into all of the pre-existing processes and pipelines, right? They're not trying to take over the world with the piece that they're adding. Rather, they're trying to add a sort of complementary element to everything that already exists. The real trick to this engine is that it's not about one individual. It's about many individuals, right? An organization isn't simply a person, it's a group of people. And so really it's about most individuals who know some stuff, but not all the stuff. And what an organization needs to do is make sure that everybody's benefiting from the stuff other people know, right? So here is an example of that. This is our 201 page. This is the page that we sort of throw probably more UR2s that people kind of opt into it based on what they need at a given moment. And what's interesting about this page is that every single method that we're sort of talking about here has lots of examples, it has lots of method things, it has sort of demonstrations of it in use, but it also has an expert that you should go and talk to because not everybody knows everything, right? And you got to be able to leverage that as an organization and you got to be able to document that knowledge and you want to get more people to be that expertise. So if one person leaves, other people are still there. But the basic idea is that like an org should be leveling up individuals as long as those individuals are also leveling up the org. I think these things are really symbiotic, even if they are traditionally very, very hard to get individuals to do. But the key here is really to think of it as a progression loop, right? There's a sort of chestnut in game development, which is this idea that if players aren't growing, they're quitting. And I think really this is why it's important at its heart to develop individuals, because it's fun to learn. It is hard, I think, to teach others. 
but it is fun to learn. And the organization also should view this as a progression loop because they also should be getting better. It's just, again, the perspectives here are a little different, right? The individual wants to grow as an individual and be rewarded for their growth. Fair enough, that's totally legitimate. The institution, at least if you're anything like ours, wants to become a respected institution, no longer scrabbling and defending its existence, right? Well, at the same time, it wants to stay at the forefront of its field, right? It's not okay to ossify your knowledge and fall behind where others are leaping ahead. And it's worth remembering that this is a way to think about just sort of progression all up in your org, right? So for us, we have a lot of people. We are a relatively large org and we have a fair differentiation here, right? I am at the principal level. This is a little bit atypical for individual URs, but it is worth noting I started at the bottom and I earned my way up. Part of why it's a little atypical is that in fact, our principal band is actually dominated by management. And for me, this progression loop was key for me to sort of level up as a UR and for to be developed. It's one of the reasons why I think it is a useful way to think about UR development because it worked for me. So I will tell you my personal story. Now, remember, these are the four lenses that I think everybody needs to be developed in. And here's how it worked for me. As a UR1, I was hired in, and I knew a lot about research because I had a PhD, and I knew something about games because I really loved playing them. As a UR2, I knew more about research because, of course, I was trained. I learned about the wonders of usability, and I got to do play tests. I also learned more about games. I spent hours at some point talking with a designer about animation systems, just understanding how they work, right? It really changed the way I saw games. But the other thing is I started to actually ship games and this let me know a little bit about production and to understand the production life cycle and the health there. As a senior you are, I'm going to say I began to get into system thinking, right, and to, to sort of see the systems that are there. I'll be honest and say I think that I wasn't particularly great at this, but at least I acknowledged their existence. Part of this is because I was given very specific um, sort of within XR projects to help me grow this and help me understand like, hey, here's how the tools team works. And here's the breadth of URs that you need to think about when you're supporting things. And here is all of the ways that we differentiate the kind of skill sets that people have. Think about us as a system, not as sort of just a place where an individual can shine. You are. I would say that again, I'm pretty good on research, you know, but I wouldn't say I've mastered it. Like, there are things that are on the 201 page that I haven't done, right? I haven't really gotten into a lot of the translation work and the international work that we're doing. I have a lot of experience with games and with watching designers solve things, but more importantly, perhaps, I have a deeper understanding of production. Like, I have a much better understanding of the way producers think, which allows me to negotiate, like, hey, can I get a headcount here because I think this part of the game is weak. That's really valuable for me, right? It allows me to have impact because it means that I ensure that I have the right manpower on the systems within the game that my research is telling me need to be amplified. And finally, the other thing that I would say is that I've got like at least a baseline understanding of the systems. Probably I would say more the systems within Xbox research than externally. This is in part because I've again been put in charge of things like this, right? So we had a product project that we codenamed Mogwai. It was about us transitioning to survey gizmo. That was why it was called Mogwai. And me just thinking through all of the ways the act of shifting a survey tool impacted everyone in XR. This made me, it forced me, let's be clear, to see the systems in place. This is an education that I value because it helps me understand where I need to put inflection points for URs and where I need to ask for things to make not just myself, but others better. I think when you look at these sort of four areas, there's a question as well of like, is this a min-max system or is this something where you can sort of cap out on all of them? So. If you were to ask me just directly, can you max out on all of these? I would probably say no. And the reason is because I've watched people who I deeply, deeply respect far outpace me in certain areas. These are the managers. So if you remember, this is how I scored myself. Um, I have 
looked at the managers around me and I didn't actually inquire what, the way that they would score themselves. So they may disagree with this entirely. I will admit that this is my perspective, but the way that I would score them looks a little bit more like this. Now, yes, I kept all the numbers consistent, but the main thing to notice here is that I knocked them back on a couple of things that are really core for me, right? I knocked them back on research and games. I knocked them back on that because it's been years for many of them when they actually did it. They understand the principles, they understand the basics, but honestly, that whole switch of survey tool, that means they have zero mastery of our current survey tool because they're, they grew up with the old survey tool, right? At the same time, they are so much better at system thinking than I am, right? It is something where anybody who has lived through the Microsoft HR system simply has to be good at mastering and understanding systems, right? When managers are first hired in Microsoft, they are given 40 hours of training. <laughs> and this is in part so they can be a healthy and natural part of the system. I'll be honest and say I am deeply, deeply grateful that I don't need to master systems nearly this much. And I hope that they are also equally grateful that there are people around them who outpace them in research. And I say this with a certain degree of confidence, because if I were to go back to that 201 page where we've put all the names on, there's really only one person here who's a manager. Everybody else who's listed, they're individual contributors, they're ICs, they are like me, they are researchers, they're not management. And the reason this manager is here is of course, because her PhD required her to know how to do re like interviews in a spectacular and beautiful way. And she has led the charge on forcing the rest of us to become better at it. And hopefully we'll have people who come in and can take this place from her and sort of carry this burden for her. Um, in part because it would be great to free her up, but also because I think when we think about this kind of loop overall, it's important to recognize that systems, when you, when you lead a system by innovating in a method because you've mastered it because an organization has taught you that, but you've also brought your own perspective, and then you've actually done the work to institutionalize this knowledge and share it with others, that's a kind of leadership. And that's something that I think a lot of teams really struggle to recognize and celebrate, right? There's a lot of talk within tech about the difference between management and IC. And this is one of the few paths where I've seen that people can actually be on par with management without having to sort of, I don't know, secretly be a manager, but not be called a manager. Let me put it that way. So for me, I think it's a fascinating path to think about in terms of up-leveling up -leveling both your individuals into becoming leaders, but also because of their leadership, leveling up your organization as a whole. So in sum, if I were to make recommendations, it is this, look internally to grow. If you have a group of people, they can make each other smarter. Document organizational knowledge. This is a priority at an organization level, even if it's not at an individual level. Build progression systems. Don't just collect smart individuals. They will leave, they win the lottery, they'll go off and get married, they'll run away, right? Reward difficulty of going to scale because it is so difficult and it, it is so vital to your organization. And then don't conflate expertise and leadership, right? I think that the managers in our org are absolute leaders, but it's not because they're experts across the board. It's because they're experts in certain areas and they pull and make the rest of us better. Think about leadership in that frame, or at least that's what I would do. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, comments, objections, concerns, please feel free to drop them into the Discord. I will absolutely look forward to reading them and responding to them there. Bye-bye. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book, How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.